Hi, good morning. My name's Nick and I'm an occasional preacher at St. George's. So I'll start with a question. Have you ever been watching a film or a play or reading a book and been shocked by the ending? You've seen a story develop, empathised strongly with the main characters and there's been twists and turns and ups and downs and you think you can see how it will all work out. But there's a new twist at the end sudden and shocking, and everything you think you're expecting is blown away. There's many great examples. I guess an obvious one is the film Titanic, where you know the ship's going to sink, but throughout the whole film, when you see it for the first time, you fully really expect after all the chaos, the young couple that fell in love on the ship will both make it through, but they don't. How do you feel when this happens? You feel like it's not right, it wasn't meant to be this way, and however stirring the arc of the story is, the shock of the ending leaves you confused. But sometimes the unexpected ending brings forth an even deeper message. I think there's something of that in this story which Jesus tells us. Parables are plain truths, but spoken in slightly hidden ways. And in this passage, Jesus is really telling us today about what he wants kingdom living to look like. To give some context, in this passage, we're joining midway through a conversation about discipline and dealing with sin and disagreements within the church. And Jesus is talking with his disciples, the very, very early church, a group who lived and worked and worshipped together. These people were, in a sense, the original group of mustard seeds planted over 2000 years ago and now grown and formed into the worldwide church we see today. So let's remember where we are, the beginnings of a revolution, with the lead revolutionary explaining to his new disciples how they are going to build a new church and ultimately a new kingdom. Jesus wants nothing less in this new kingdom than a complete change in mindset and a complete change in hearts. One of the best illustrations of this is right at the start of the passage. Peter asks, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? He knows, and of course Jesus knows, that the long-held rabbinical tradition was that you should give your forgive your neighbour three times. But Peter has absorbed what Jesus has told him over his ministry about the nature of forgiveness and mercy, and how the rule book has been thrown out of the window, and how we're not bound by the law in the same way we were before. And so before Jesus can even respond, Peter offers his own answer, going from three up to seven. But the answer Jesus gives would have been surprising. I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Translation, there isn't a number. There's no accounting and no arithmetic anymore. Jesus wants a forgiving heart and a forgiving attitude. He then pivots straight to the parable itself where he tells the story of the unforgiving employee. A master has many employees and one of them, somehow, has run up a huge debt owed to the master. 10,000 bags of gold or so, depending on the translation. But it's a huge, huge sum. Clearly, there's some hyperbole at work here. But the point is that it's a vast amount of money and the employee would never ever really be able to pay it off. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered he and his wife and children be sold to pay off the debt. Although this sounds extremely cruel to our ears, it's described in a rather matter-of-fact kind of way, apparently what the law required, and we can only surmise that the disciples would have understood this as the expected response of the master. But the employee falls to his knees and pleads with the master for patience so that he can have more time to repay the debt. And when the master hears this, he cancels the debt entirely. It's a powerful story, even up to here, echoing many others from the Bible, showing redemption and grace that is mercifully and freely given. And there are two really important things to bring out. First, the employee recognises his own debt. He understands the only way out of it is the mercy of the master. Secondly, the master actually grants him much more than he's asked for. The employee asks for more time, but what he gets is full and complete forgiveness from his debts, a life of freedom over bondage. But having released, having been released from this vast debt, the employee then seeks someone else out who owes him a much, much smaller debt. 
He physically chokes him and the words he had just pleaded before the master are played back to him. Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But the unforgiving employee refuses to allow this and has the one who owes him money thrown into prison. The power of the parable is in a huge disconnect between what our unforgiving employee receives and what he failed to give. And the disconnect is so huge that we have to wonder whether the employee really understood the debt he had been forgiven. He was released from debt, but it didn't change how he lived or his attitude. He didn't really believe in forgiveness. He simply took advantage of it when it suited him. In the final act of the story, word of this reaches the master. Imagine yourselves hearing this parable for the first time and thinking to yourself, what would the master do? Well, the master is angry. Having forgiven the debt previously, the master exercises his power to rescind the forgiveness and hands the unforgiving employee to the jailers to be tortured. When we read this, perhaps we think the unforgiving employee has got what he deserved. But there's a part of this, surely, which surprises us, even if we know the passage. The master has shown vast, almost infinite mercy previously, but where is that mercy now? It's not like the story of the prodigal son, where no matter what the son does, the father at the end of the story rushes out to meet the prodigal son with only love in his eyes and his arms open wide. It's not like Joseph, whose brother sold him into slavery and years later he forgives them. Instead, here is a master who sees that the employee is falling short and punishes him. The king's mercy appears to be conditional. And then Jesus steps out of the story, almost like in films where an actor might turn to the camera and break the wall of fiction and says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. And to me, when I read the story with fresh eyes, this is where I struggle. This is where the plot twist shocks me. We pray to a God of mercy, forgiveness, who is slow to anger and abounding in love. We worship a God of never ending, overwhelming love, of amazing grace that has set us all free. But here is Jesus now telling us very plainly that if we're not ourselves forgiving, then we are not forgiven. How do we respond to this? Let's step back for a minute and talk about forgiveness itself. The truth is that life sometimes hurts in really specific ways that cause us emotional or mental or physical harm. And biblical forgiveness is deep and complicated. It doesn't purge the pain, erase the anger or gloss over guilt. It doesn't mean letting wrongdoers go without justice. But as with many things that Jesus talked about, Biblical forgiveness turns the world upside down. It blesses those who curse us. It's not a performance or a duty or a tradition. It needs to be, as Jesus says here, from the heart. This is what is emphasized in this passage. And there's lots that can be said about Christian forgiveness. And there's an amazing richness of stories in the Bible which illustrate and explore this. And from this passage, I can just pick out two things which strike me as really important. Firstly, forgiveness is essential to our Christian lives, especially within church communities. It's not just an optional extra. There's no doubt that Jesus is placing a massive emphasis on the importance of forgiveness. He's asked, in some ways, a fairly simple question by Peter, but chooses to answer with a very vivid illustration with a very powerful message. Think about the Lord's Prayer presented earlier in Matthew. Every line in the Lord's Prayer is about God the Father, who he is, what he does, and his kingdom, with one exception. The only single bit of the Lord's Prayer that talks about an action we do is where it says, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. So God sets high standards for forgiveness between us, and we need to be continually forgiving each other as a community and with the wider community. But we recognize it's difficult. We recognise there are situations where it seems hard or even impossible, but Jesus really wants us to have willing hearts to start on a journey of forgiveness. Another important point is that our own forgiveness is part of our ongoing relationship with God. 
Let's remember the way the unforgiving employee originally went to the master. He was on his knees, recognizing his absolute need of the mercy of the master. And the power of the cross means we are forgiven, full stop. But we do need to be honest before God about where we fall short, either by doing wrong things or failing to do the right things. This is vital for our relationship with our loving God. And maybe not literally, but figuratively speaking, we need to say it out loud. As Psalm 32 says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. So, forgiveness is essential to Christian life, especially in the church as the body of Christ. Remember, Jesus was talking to his disciples and giving them messages to be sowed in the very early church at the outset of God's earthly kingdom. Secondly, we need to recognise our own sin and say it out loud to God as part of our relationship with him. I think one thing this parable does is show how the two are linked together. Jesus wants our relationship with each other to be like a mirror image of his relationship with us. We see this throughout the Bible in Matthew. Freely you have received, freely give. In 1 John, we love because he first loved us. So if this passage says one thing, maybe it is, we forgive because he forgave us. To accept grace and the power of the cross, to truly deeply accept it as a core part of our being that shapes the way we live, we need to understand how we fall short and how we couldn't do it ourselves. And if we truly understand that and the power of God's forgiveness in our lives, then we must have room in our hearts for forgiveness of others. It seems to me that what Jesus really signals here and the very final verse in this passage is complicated. And there's lots that could be said about that. But really, fundamentally, what Jesus is saying is that the gospel doesn't give us the option of simply taking the mercy that flows from the cross and using it as a get out of jail card. It needs to change who we are and how we live. And that means, conversely, maybe someone who is consistently harsh and unforgiving may not be living the new life that God intends them to. We're called to love everyone, even our enemies, and even in situations where there is pain and grief and anger. Forgiveness is arguably the ultimate expression of the love that Christ calls us to have for one another. If that's correct, then this parable is really Jesus challenging us today as the body of the church with a simple question. Do you really believe in forgiveness? If we really believe in the forgiveness we've been granted, we can't fail to show at least a portion of it to others. That doesn't mean it's not difficult. And it doesn't mean that we have to do it lightly or even easily, but showing a small portion of the forgiveness that we've been given can just mean taking the first step on what could be a long journey. And if there's work that needs to be done in your own situations to take that first step, do talk to people you trust, reach out to your home group, or the pastoral team, because Jesus in this passage calls us directly to orient our hearts towards forgiveness and to always have a heart that's willing to take that first step. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for the forgiveness that you've shown to us. And we pray, Lord, that in our lives, we can mirror that forgiveness, even when there is anger and pain and guilt and suffering. We pray, Lord, that as we work towards your kingdom, we can show the world just a small portion of your love and forgiveness to others. Amen.